Welcome everybody, welcome to Smith Gambrell. We're glad you could come out today and uh, hope you enjoy the presentation from Professor Kang. Uh, Professor Kang is a graduate of Chicago's Law School and clerked on the Seventh Circuit after his graduation. Worked in Boston, a firm for a while. And I was here when he came on to law school and he was there my, my last year of law school and we're excited he uh, came to us. And we're excited he's here today to talk about um, a case that's been in the news and maybe he'll tell us what it actually means as opposed to what the uh, pundits have said it means. I personally want to know whether uh, Doritos can sponsor candidates. That's the thing that's on top of my list, but the rest of it I'm sure he'll uh, tell us. And without further ado, Professor Kane, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, thanks for uh, having me here. I'm really excited to be here. I know uh, Smith Gambrell is a great supporter of Emory Law School. Um, uh, and um, really excited to talk about Citizens United, which I think is one of the more important cases um, that we've seen in a while in campaign finance. Um, so I've got a few brief kind of things to say about Citizens United, maybe explain a little bit about what uh, the case was about. And then I thought we'd spend most of the time uh, for discussion and questions from you guys. Um, I have less in terms of uh, prepared paper or anything to present than, than kind of think about what just happened um, and the change to campaign finance law. So Citizens United dealt with a federal prohibition on the use of corporate, union, and a few other entities, uh, treasury funds for expenditures, campaign expenditures, in connection with federal elections. And basically versions of this type of prohibition on corporate and union money had been upheld in Previous cases, including Austin, which is one of the cases uh, that you've heard a lot about in the news, and McConnell, uh, which reviewed uh, McCain-Feingold. Um, so, so this was the issue uh, before the court and Citizens United. And Citizens United had a long history um, before it reached the court even. Um, I had a chance to talk to Michael Bowes, uh, who was uh, general counsel for Citizens United. As he explained it to me, the, the beginning of the case, really, they just wanted to run their ads, and they wanted to challenge disclosure provisions, and this kind of case evolved over a long period of time, and it wasn't until a week after they filed the case initially that they got this offer to run this Hillary movie that they had produced um, on, as video on demand, and, and that's really where the Supreme Court case evolved, and the question before the court the first time around was whether this Hillary the movie um, could be offered by a corporation um, through video on demand without violating um, federal campaign finance law. Um, during the first oral argument before the court, there was this kind of this weird moment where the government uh, conceded that, the, that it may violate federal campaign finance law uh, for a corporation to fund a book that contained express advocacy during the relevant periods under McCain-Feingold. Um, and it, it really bothered a bunch of the justices, noticeably, um, the idea of banning books close to an election. Um, and that seemed to make a difference. Uh, according to Bose, the lawyer for uh, Citizens United, he, his reaction was that for Alito and Roberts in particular, they hadn't been on the court very long. They hadn't considered a lot of campaign finance issues. And this was sort of a shock that they hadn't, they hadn't really considered the, the implications of federal campaign finance law as it stood. And it forced them to kind of reevaluate uh, what Citizens United would mean. And so, as some of you probably remember, um, the court decided not to issue a ruling based on the initial briefing and the initial argument. Instead, ordered rebriefing and re-argument um, on the larger question about whether uh, Austin uh, should be overruled. That is, whether the federal prohibition on corporate money uh, on expenditures in federal campaigns ought to be overruled. That had been a long staple of federal campaign finance law. Uh, you know, whether it's 50 years or 100 years, um, it had been around for a long time. It was sort of established precedent before the court, and now the court was gonna, was gonna reconsider that. Um, what's clear here is the court reached out for this issue. So, uh, when Citizens United first petitioned the court for relief, if you look at the jurisdictional statement, it's pretty clear that they weren't asking the court to overrule Austin. This was something that the court decided uh, after the initial oral argument that um, the question whether to overrule Austin just had to be faced, at least in their view. And this has been kind of uh, a big controversy in the wake of Citizens United, whether the court overstepped its bound, whether it, it uh, was wrong to overrule precedent, uh, in a way that Roberts, kind of in his confirmation hearings, had emphasized uh, he didn't believe was, was uh, good practice. Um, this offends a lot of people that once you saw a change in the court, uh, 
from the Rehnquist court to the Roberts court, you suddenly see a change in the law. This bothers me probably less than it bothers a lot of people, but it certainly bo bothered a lot of people. What it does show clearly is there's a shift between the Rehnquist court and the Roberts court. There's no doubt about that. Um, we often sort of wait for these big changes in uh, where the court stands based on change in personnel. Often there isn't as big a change as we, we, we would think, um, but I think in campaign finance law, the change in personnel means a lot. So the shift from O'Connor and Rehnquist on campaign finance law to Roberts and Alito has made a big difference. So if you ask me, so, uh, if once we get into the kind of the legal substance of the case, you know, uh, f as a matter of full disclosure, I'm sort of in the middle on campaign finance law. Not really, uh, uh, I, I don't really run to either extreme. And I think there's lots of reasons Citizens United um, probably could win that case if we thought about this before the, the ruling came out. Um, and, and the government basically begged the court to decide Citizens United in favor of Citizens United on narrower grounds than it did. What, what the court did here was decided on fairly broad grounds, which is to strike down not only the provisions in this case, um, but it seems that it's unconstitutional for the court, uh, for the government to restrict um, corporate spending in campaign finance, and it's probably going to be broader than the specific provisions struck down in Citizens United itself. Once we think about the, the substance of the case, one of the big issues, as Mark and I were discussing right before um, the event, um, is the question of whether corporations are people and whether that, uh, whether that matters here. And it's, that was really kind of the, the tagline that came out of a lot of the stories, the question whether corporations are people and therefore have First Amendment rights. For some people, this is an easy case. Corporations aren't people, therefore they don't have First Amendment rights, um, and therefore Citizens United should lose this case. Um, it's not clear to me that that's a terribly useful question. Um, if it was the case that corporations were people, that they were born and went to school and, and had full lives, um, then this, this case would be easy. Then, then corporations would have First Amendment rights in the fullest sense, including the right to spend um, in federal elections. Um, Corporations aren't people, but that doesn't mean that they don't have First Amendment rights. There's all different kinds of associations uh, that aren't people, like political parties. And we give them rights because we think it's appropriate or necessary uh, to vindicate the rights of the people who, who constitute those institutions. Um, and that might be the case here, too, for corporations. Um, it, that's not clear to me, though, that uh, corporate expenditures here are necessary for the vindication of the individual rights of shareholders or the people who constitute a corporation. Um, shareholders um, struck me, at least, the way I think about it. Shareholders seem to be, before, uh, before Citizens United, um, in the same position as non-shareholders, in that they could aggregate through political parties or through PACs. Um, and uh, it wasn't clear to me that it was unconstitutional for the government to regulate corporations, that particular kind of associational form, when shareholders, just as well as non-shareholders, could aggregate funds through other types of entities that were open to them. Um, it surprises me a little bit that uh, the vehemence of some people who insist on First Amendment rights for corporations. I can see this as a kind of fairly discreet legal issue. I don't go to bed at night really worrying about the rights of corporations. Um, but it seems like this really struck a nerve that, that surprised me a bit. Um, so why do corporations get the right to spend uh, expenditures uh, in connection with federal campaigns, according to the court? The court reasoned that uh, the First Amendment disallows regulation um, unless the government interest uh, is satisfied in preventing uh, actual or apparent quid pro quo corruption. So this is the kind of rationale that the government has to use as a constitutional matter to justify any kind of campaign finance regulation. Um, and that interest, the government's interest in regulating campaign finance, had expanded under the Rehnquist Court. So in a bunch of uh, decisions over 20 years, we saw the government's interest, the government's discretion to regulate in campaign finance, expand from what was articulated a little bit narrowly in Buckley to cover, for instance, the appearance of corruption and the worry about public perception about corruption. Um, there was also a kind of logic built into Austin, this case that was overruled, um, that when you have immense spending um, by virtue of economic wealth, that it distorts the kind of marketplace of ideas, um, and, and that's a problem, and the government is entitled constitutionally to address uh, that problem through campaign finance regulation. 
But Citizens United, and here's why I think the most important thing about Citizens United, takes a narrow view of the government interest in regulation. And this is the real takeaway, um, I think, the, the key doctrinal move that, that's going to matter in a bunch of cases to come. Um, the court really narrows the interest in regulation. Um, and that, that affects not just these regulations of, of corporate expenditures, but all different types of regulation. That, and we haven't yet started to see uh, where the court's going to play this out in other areas. Um, so we, we need to find um, a government interest in the prevention of quid pro quo corruption. And the court in Citizens United says independent expenditures present no risk of uh, corruption. And there was a bit of a conflict in campaign finance law before Citizens United. Buckley had, had um, said that independent expenditures present no risk of corruption. That is, if, if Mark is a, is a candidate for federal office, if I give him money, and then he runs an ad, there's a risk of corruption because I'm giving him money and he's got, he may feel like he needs to offer me something back or that's what I'm looking for in the exchange. So there's an exchange uh, and the government's entitled, therefore, to regulate that exchange through contribution limits. But if I run the same ad that Mark wants to run without coordinating with him, I run that independently, the court theorized, well, there's no exchange and Mark doesn't owe me anything and therefore, there's no risk of corruption, even if it's the same ad, right? Now, you know, there's some sensibility to that idea, but as a matter of political reality, that's probably absurd. Because if Mark knows that I'm running this ad and I'm paying for it, whether I give him the money to pay for it or I do it myself, there's a sense of obligation that exists either way. Maybe it's not quite as strong, but we would think that there's some risk of corruption. I think that's where Citizens United probably makes the least sense. It really weighs heavily on this distinction between contributions and independent expenditures that, that, that it's there in Buckley, um, but argues that because corporations are spending money independently, there's no risk of corruption. And in fact, if anyone spends money independently uh, through independent expenditures, there's no risk of corruption. Therefore, the government's not entitled to regulate any of that. Um, I'm not sure that that makes sense. That sort of defies political reality. And exhibit A of that um, is probably the court's previous decision in Caperton versus Massey, which maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, but just less than a year ago, Justice Kennedy, who wrote Citizens United, also wrote Caperton. In Caperton, there was about $2.5 million worth of independent expenditures um, to support the campaign of a West Virginia Supreme Court justice. And there the court said, there is enough of a risk of corruption, essentially, um, that we would worry about the bias uh, of the, a justice who's elected on the strength of campaign contributions. We would worry about the bias when that campaign contributor later is before the court. Right? So Justice Kennedy had kind of acknowledged in Caperton that these independent expenditures present some risk of bias that we would worry about, and at least in Caperton, demanded recusal. But in Citizens United, the, the theory is independent expenditures present no risk of corruption, and therefore corporations ought to be able to spend freely. Um, that conflict, I'm not sure, was really addressed in, in Citizens United. Kennedy tries to dispense with Caperton in one paragraph, and, and I didn't find it terribly convincing. Um, so ultimately, I'm, I'm OK with the court overruling precedent. That happens all the time. There's lots of cases out there that don't make sense. Um, but I'd like to be convinced about the logic of the new case that's doing the overruling. Um, and I'm not sure I'm there with, with Citizens United. I'm not sure I find Citizens United all that convincing to the degree that it relies on this distinction between contributions and independent expenditures and the, the corrupting influence uh, that attaches to either one of those. So what are the consequences of Citizens United? So I think a lot of the short-term um, focus, and at least a lot of the calls I got from the media were about what this is going to do to spending in elections? And that's, that, that makes a lot of sense to ask that question. I'm not sure that this is going to open the floodgates the way that a lot of people fear. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Corporations don't want to be associated with um, a losing campaign and have to face the wrath of, of candidates who, um, who have won despite their opposition. Uh, corporations don't want to be attached to uh, a lot of political uh, causes and, and political campaigns. They'll have to make their own decisions. It'll be variable over corporations, over circumstance. Um, but we know, for instance, in Georgia, where corporations can spend in elections, um, it doesn't lead to the end of the world. Um, 
corporations that are involved in some places and, and not involved in others. So as a practical matter, I'm not sure we're going to see a huge change in the way that elections are run. We're going to see more money. We're going to see more corporate money spent in elections. Um, but I don't think it's going to be revolutionary. Where I think potentially the implications of uh, Citizens United could be revolutionary um, is in the doctrinal sense. And so remember I mentioned earlier that Citizens United really tries to narrow uh, the conception of corruption upon which uh, the government's entitled to act and regulate. Um, I think Citizens United might be only the first step. So realize the Rehnquist court had gone through about two decades where they had, in almost every case, deferred to the government and upheld campaign finance regulation. And now we've seen the Roberts court, a real shift, where at least in three very high profile decisions, um, the court has struck down uh, campaign finance regulation decided against the government. Um, and Justice Kennedy's views in particular, as it is in so many areas, seem critical here. He wrote Citizens United. He seems to be the swing vote on a lot of different issues. And Justice Kennedy's been pretty clear, for instance, in his McConnell dissent, that he views the corruption interests very narrowly, which means that the government's discretion to regulate is, is very narrow as well. Um, and it really focuses on contributions to candidates. Right? And so if I give money to Mark as a federal candidate, um, the government can regulate that. But Kennedy seems really skeptical that we can regulate much else, because that's really the core of the corruption uh, interest. And if that's right, then lots of other federal campaign finance regulation may be up for grabs. For instance, if I give money instead to Danielle, under federal campaign finance law, even if Danielle's not a, a candidate for office, that's still a contribution to the degree that Danielle is now engaging in, in expenditures and campaign speech. Um, it's not clear to me that Kennedy would find that a regulable transaction, given that Danielle can't really offer me anything. She's not an office holder. She's not a candidate. And it seems to me that if Kennedy has his way, if you kind of trace out um, to a, maybe a logical extreme, it's not clear that the court will buy it, buy it all the way, um, but we could see a rollback of lots of different types of campaign finance regulation. And that's where I think Citizens United is probably its most interesting and, and most controversial, more, much more so than um, kind of the practical implications in the short term on spending. Okay. So I think with that, um, I'll stop and open up discussion and, and take questions. Uh, yeah. Um, what about uh, the, the federal? Well, the federal law has limits on campaign spending or and campaign not expenditures but <coughs> spending or contributions by individuals. Do they not? I mean, what could you not? Could the federal government not impose the same limits on corporations as they do on individuals? So I, I guess this goes to your point of yeah. maybe this isn't so revolutionary because it seems that that would be the first step. Yeah, so independent expenditures, as long as we're not talking about a contribution to a federal candidate, independent expenditures are constitutionally protected. So if you want to go out and run a bunch of campaign ads out of your own pocket, the government can't limit that. So what this does is put corporations in the same position as you. So corporations now can spend their treasury dollars on, on an unlimited basis, in all likelihood, um, just the way an individual can on independent expenditures. What kind of disclosure requirements can the government impose? Um, so here's my chance to, to show off um, one of our students. This is Danielle Friedman. She's a 3L at Emory. Um, she actually worked on a number of the briefs, the amicus briefs in Citizens United, knows a lot more about disclosure probably than, than anyone else I know. So I, I'm going to swing it over to her and let show off uh, Danielle a bit. Um, so uh, full disclosure, I. Um, I sort of worked on the side of the dissent in Citizens United, so those are where my views are coming from, just so you know. Um, so the disclosure part of Justice Kennedy's opinion, I actually very much agree with, um, and seven of the justices did. So they said that disclosure requirements uh, are completely constitutional, and that as they were in Buckley and McConnell, that the court is going to continue to uphold them as sort of a more narrow way to regulate, that disclosure requirements sort of get at the same issues, but they don't um, violate the Constitution in terms of the First Amendment. So I think disclosure is still very much alive and well in terms of the campaign finance regulation. Um, for how long that's going to be the case, I'm not sure. Uh, Justice Kennedy does uh, sort of articulate that there are as-applied challenges that um, 
some plaintiffs could win in terms of disclosure <coughs> being unconstitutional to them, but facially the disclosure provisions are still there. Um, the court is set to look at this issue in some capacity in Doe v. Reed later this term. So I think disclosure is going to come back and come back very quickly. Um, but for the moment, there are seven justices, uh, Justice Thomas being the only exception, and that was the only part of the opinion that he dissented on. And he thought the disclosure provisions were unconstitutional, but at this point, they are still uh, considered very much constitutional and I think will continue to be for uh, at least the short term. So yeah, disclosure is generally viewed as less constitutionally troubling. Um, it doesn't put a limit on speech, it, uh, unlike contribution limits or an expenditure limit. Um, and so generally speaking, except for Clarence Thomas, justices think disclosure is okay. Um, and I think that'll be fairly critical in, in exactly how, what the practical implications of Citizens United are, because I think corporations, I'd be interested to get the views of uh, people who represent corporations here. Um, I think corporations will be a little leery about getting too politically involved in a lot of instances. and to the degree they can shield their identity through disclo uh, away from disclosure requirements, then they'll be more interested in, in participating actively. But to the degree that disclosure forces um, uh, disclosure of the, the identity of, of sponsors, corporate sponsors, um, they'll probably be uh, more reluctant to get involved. Um, and, and the Schumer, Schumer uh, Senator Schumer's proposed legislation on this issue. So, um, you would presume that corporations would be the same place as individuals. So if, if you pay for an independent expenditure, um, <laughs> then there's disclosure that, you, that you're the, the, the sponsor of, of that ad. Um, and that would probably be the same thing for a corporation. Um, the, the, the concern that Senator Schumer's bill is trying to address is that corporations may pool their money through another entity that has a name like Americans for America. Um, and you wouldn't know <laughs> where the money came from. And so Schumer's bill is trying to force disclosure of the chief sponsor um, who paid for the, the ad, even if it's someone other than the main entity, that, that if you're Americans for America and they're running an ad, they have to disclose that it's really Exxon that really gave them the bulk of the money for the ad. Um, so that's one of the provisions that's before Congress right now. So I think you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Um during the recent State of the Union address, there was a, an apparent disagreement between the executive and judicial branches on um, the implications of this case. Can you briefly speak to that? Well, yeah, the, I think it had to do with um, uh, foreign influence. Um, so Citizens United is really about corporations, not about provisions of foreign, uh, sorry, camp, federal campaign finance law that prohibit um, foreign citizens from contributing to elections or making expenditures. Um, so, so we can think of those as separate. So I think the prohibition on corporate expenditures is contained in 441B. I think the prohibition on foreign participation is 441E. And actually the court has a couple paragraphs in Citizens United that, that kind of distinguish those two things. Um, and there are already, the FEC already regulates um, foreign corporations um, and, and uh, limits their participation. Um, I think there are, though, gaps in federal campaign finance law that exist mainly because up until now, we haven't had to think about corporations making expenditures at all. Um, so for instance, if you have a, a, corp a U.S. corporation that's owned um, predominantly by a, a foreign citizen, what do we do with that? And so there, there are gaps in federal campaign finance law um, where Congress probably <coughs> will act, I think. Um, but they're not, they don't necessarily present constitutional issues of the same way that Citizens United itself did. So I think Obama was right in the sense that there are opportunities or there are gaps right now in regulation that are created by Citizens United, but they're not gaps that the court would prevent Congress from filling. Yep. Well, following up on the disclosure, I actually read these opinions and I would say disagree with Thomas and just about everything he writes, but but in theory, he seemed correct based on Kennedy's statement in the majority opinion that if you decide that spending money for a candidate does not itself lead to corruption or the appearance of corruption, then why doesn't that undermine the government's authority to even keep track of who's spending the money? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's potentially a problem with um, Kennedy's position. I, Justice Thomas takes a really absolutist position that that um, 
doesn't think contributions should be regulated. He really doesn't think there's a place for federal campaign finance law in his view. Political speech is kind of the core of the First Amendment. So there's, that's where we should apply the greatest First Amendment protection, um, not the kind of middling constitutional protection that, that we normally do. Um, so I think that's a fair criticism uh, of Kennedy's position. I think, in general, um, federal campaign finance law is kind of a compromise. So there's lots of areas where um, federal campaign finance law, law professors like me, we can have fun like drilling the court's logic and, and tearing it up. Um, but the truth is, federal campaign finance law is really hard um, because it's a compromise between worries about economic power um, and, and liberty, um, and, and there's no way to kind of split the difference between those two um, very easily in the kind of clear legal categories that we normally apply. Um, so I, I would imagine that Kennedy's position is as much a political one as a legal one, which is that you know he thinks that. Corporations ought to be able to spend. People, shareholders ought to be able to aggregate through sh corporations. Um, but disclosure doesn't seem that bad. Um, I, I, it can't be justified as neatly as a, as a logical matter as, as maybe someone like I would like. Um, but I think that that's the real reason um, Kennedy comes out where he does. Yeah, I was curious. When did the? I mean, one could make an argument. <coughs> The for-profit corporations, because they're in business to make money, <coughs> have a commercial motive even in their political speech. What happened to the argument that they can't engage in political speech, that all of their speech is ultimately commercial? Why did that get swept away without discussion? So the idea here, or you have to understand Kennedy's premise here, which is the First Amendment likes speech. So the more speech we can have, the better. And that if people are persuaded by bad arguments, that's what democracy is about. Right? So Kennedy cites Bellotti a lot, which is, which is really all about this idea, that democracy contemplates the idea that people will be persuaded by bad ideas, and that that's just the, the rules of the game. Um, and what we're not going to do is try to equalize or, or try to regulate speech to reach the right outcome. So if corporations are motivated by a commercial motive, fine. Um, people can evaluate uh, their, their motives. Uh, they can evaluate the persuasiveness of those messages. Um, if they're persuasive, then that's all the better. We'll reach the right result. If they're not, they'll reject them. Um, but commercial speech can be regulated. In fact, it is all the time. Oh, I see. So you, you, yes. you mean it, you're invoking yes. a different legal category. Yes, that's correct. Commercial yes. speech is regulated all the time. Yes. You don't see liquor ads on TV. Right. I, I, think, question that. I think Kennedy it's wants really to protect. It's not, it's not the thrust of the protection of the First Amendment. Yeah. But from the standpoint of the listener, yes. Kennedy regards that as political well, speech. One could right. argue so it's that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Because that, what's really that, behind it isn't revealed. From the motivation. Yes. Right? But when you think about the protection of the marketplace of ideas, mm -hmm. at least from Kennedy's standpoint, that speech has political value that we want to protect. Well, let me ask another question. I have one other. And, and I know this is, goes to much earlier cases, but what is the origin of the idea that money equals speech? What is the origin of the idea that a guy with a billion dollars somehow has a greater right to speech than the guy out behind the dumpster? That well, that was the intention of the framers of the First Amendment, by the way. So that, that's from Buckley. Right? That's what Buckley is, is, yes. is about. It's a, the big seminal case from which all um, well, federal campaign finance is a concept. Well, I buy in part way, in all honesty. And this is where I, where, I, where I said at the beginning that I'm somewhere in the middle on federal campaign finance law. Because um, I have some sympathy for your view that I don't want wealth to dominate, right? I, I don't think it's fair in some sense, and I don't think it's necessarily good for democracy that someone with more money has a greater opportunity to speak. But on the other hand, um, I think it's clearly right that the ability to spend is connected with free speech. And, and so we don't want to discourage free speech. We don't want to discourage political speech. If we believe in the marketplace of ideas, we think that people will reach good decisions when they're presented with good arguments. We want to encourage the chance that good arguments are going to be out there. Um, so I have sympathy for both ideas, and I'm not sure that one clearly trumps the other. Well, let, let me ask one other question. Most of the speech we're talking about is like, well, this was a movie. It's like TV advertising, things like that. Does anybody seriously believe that you get the marketplace of good ideas from TV ads? Is that what the court was really telling us? That's the marketplace of good ideas? I mean, what a joke. 
Isn't I, it? I mean, seriously, let's be real here. Let's don't talk. Let's don't talk like yeah. like we're like we're imaginary people. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if you're looking for an answer for me, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I, I think the court enough. the court sa says yes. I think so the court says those types of ads. I mean, one is this was a movie. It was like an hour and a half movie. So, so we might think it's different. Um, it's not clear that it's different. But even ads, yeah, that's what a lot of federal campaign finance law is. It, that, that's what it pays for is, is 30 second ads. And the idea is that that affects people's decisions. That has a speech component that's protected by the First Amendment. So yeah, the court's answer to that is yes, that that, that is important speech. I'm not sure I agree with you on disclosures because what we're seeing already being set up is the next set of fighting, which is uh, there's a, a fairly consistent set of cases about anonymous uh, political speech. And there are a lot of people who are now taking the fact that corporations can, can you know, spend as long as it's independent and they, they can combine to do it. Why can't they do it? Uh, if, if they have First Amendment rights, why can't they do it anonymously? And I know of at least four cases that are being set up to challenge that. Yeah. Do you want to say something about that? or? Um, I think that's right. I, I definitely agree with that position that there are a number of cases um, that are being set up to challenge the disclosure provisions. I don't think they're going to facially challenge them. I think they'll challenge them in that the disclosure provisions won't be applied to particular groups because of a threat of harassment or violence based on the disclosure. So I think that the, the justice's view that disclosure is constitutional fa facially is pretty sound, but I do think that the as-applied challenges will get so broad that it'll sort of swallow the rule, and so the ultimate impact will be that the disclosure provisions won't be very useful, but I think that um, the court is, is convinced that disclosure is sort of more acceptable, and they'll just broaden the rule so far that it swallows the rule entirely. I, so I think it will take a number of cases to mm -hmm. do that, but I think that it will happen fairly quickly. Yeah, I, I think, um, so Buckley actually makes exactly this point right. that, that you know, if we see evidence that there's harassment, then disclosure could be a problem, uh, more problematic and, and um, not clearly constitutional in the way that seems to be the case if you look at the series of cases since Buckley. Um, there's a, there's a kind of new twist um, uh, on disclosure issues, I think probably in the last eight years because of the internet. Uh, I think disclosure 20 years ago um, wasn't as uh, challenging for the government to justify because there weren't that many people who were willing to go, at, first of all, disclosure took some time. So the disclosure statement filed with the government and the government having to put that in some sort of publishable form and then to find out that information, you actually had to go find it somewhere. Um, and it was just a lot more, um, a lot, lot more of a hassle. Now, uh, disclosure happens electronically, and it's available on the internet immediately. You can go back to your office and, and look up <coughs> the campaign contributions of all your friends and your office mates and, and people who are down the hall from you. Um, my students can do it in class, right, as I'm explaining this. Um, and uh, the threat or the worry about harassment and the availability of information kind of changes some of the issues and we've seen that actually um, in some of the ballot measure campaigns in California where <laughs> people have looked up opponents of certain ballot measures that are particularly controversial um, and boycotted their businesses or picketed um, um, their businesses. Um, and so I think the court is really thinking about these issues differently and that's part of what's going on Doe versus Reed. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in that case. Any other questions? Anybody, anybody? All right. Well, there's no more questions. Unless you have more remarks you want to spin I, off the cuff. We have more time. I think I'm... We have an eager audience. I'm tapped. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we appreciate everybody coming out today. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoyed Professor Kay. I hope you enjoyed me in giving him a round of applause for this talk. participating in these discussions with the law school brings out and uh, we're glad you guys come and just stay with us. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>